so for me, I enjoyed reading the yellow wallpaper, not only because of the affective bond between um, the reader and the character, but also between the characters that the protagonist um, can feel empathy for the other women she sees behind the yellow wallpaper and kind of forming the solidarity against patriarchal oppression. Wow, you're giving away one of my punchlines here <laughs> that uh, this is very much a critique of patriarchy, yes, uh, but I think many of us noticed it's just a matter of how it's done. Um, yeah, thank you very much. And the bonding with the character in the paper itself is interesting an imagined female other that empowers her um awesome yes and that reading is exactly not the opposite but it's really contrasting with what jennifer just said because it's not focusing on mental illness but rather on this feminist awakening so this the title of my talk today. And I think what you just pointed out is really fascinating because it mirrors the history of reception of this story. Because initially, more readers had emphasized this uh, narrative that Jennifer uh, articulated just now, where people saw the protagonist as also having these problems and that this is in many way or was read as a, a story of gothic fiction or horror, very much like Edgar Allan Poe's stories, right? And there's that, but then there's also, and that is certainly more the temporary reading, the understanding that the narrator is really moving from the sense of being trapped in this room to then eventually getting out. So this moment of liberation and becoming more assertive. So that's really um, very much to the core of what I was going to say. Is there anyone else before I begin with the PowerPoint uh, who wants to share what might be fascinating and why has it been this uh, mainstay of feminist uh, literature? It's like one of the classics ever since 1970. So that is what, 50 years now? So um, all we need now is that Sieglinde gives her orders. Okay, doke. so the order is the first slide, uh, and here we go. So, obviously, we have a publication from 1892, and we have four protagonists. The unnamed narrator, her husband, who is also kind of agreeing with another gentleman, the doctor. We have the husband's sister, as you all know, and we have this figure in the background, in the paper, the wallpaper itself, that is referred to as strange, provoking formless. And um, it's the, you might want to do the presenter's mode instead. Because a lot of the slides are animated and that'll make it more appealing. Exactly. So this is what I've been saying so far. And as we already established there are two basic interpretations to this narrative, A and B. So A would be what Nicole laid out and B is what Jennifer pointed out. Now click and A means that the narrator is sane, but a victim of this 
of circumstances. And in this case, their male dominated um, society or the two representatives, John and Mr. Ware, are really standing in for a male dominated society. And in that regard, she is, no, no, not yet. She's sane and is a representative of what's called a new woman. Interpretation B is, and I'm using the word beast, which starts with a B, <laughs> that she is insane, that she's this mad woman, and that she is a victim of mental illness, as Jennifer suggested, and that would make her a patient. So now let's move on to the next slide, which is one of the images that you saw when you read the story. And here I want to walk you through a close reading of this visual by way of building up the interpretation A, that this is a nice, sane person and a typical representative of womanhood of the time. And to understand that and really pick out the clues, you would have to know a little bit about the cult of domesticity and this understanding of true womanhood. But since this is a lecture series on 19th century women writers, I assume that you're more or less um, familiar with that concept. So let's begin with um, the background before we get to the notion of true womanhood. So we see the windows and the bars, and that stands, obviously, you all noticed, for the sense of confinement, which is a topic within the short story. Now, next arrow shows us the, okay, now on the top, you see her outfit, and that is very typical of that of the so-called true woman. Um, her hair is tied up in a bun. She has this neat dress. And that is very much part of this Victorian uh, era's uh, idea of what women should look like. Now, another era takes us to the pen and the pencil. In this case, this is her diary writing, what is depicted here, which in the context of the narrative we learn is forbidden. Now, this is not, we can't generalize that. It wasn't generally forbidden for uh, Victorian ladies to write. They were certainly reading a lot. But here, given the diagnosis, this is then becoming more and more dangerous even for the narrator to keep on writing. So lastly, the rocking chair. This symbolizes very much the fact that as you see in the captions, we are in the middle of the nursery room and the rocking chair might stand for the domestic sphere in general, but here given the captions, it is maybe a nursing chair that is rocking and that could be interpreted as a sign of the sense of immo immobility into which women at the time were forced, right? So they weren't allowed to go out into the world. They were kept at home. And what did they have to do or what were they allowed to do was uh, reading and maybe helping in the kitchen and sitting in a rocking chair. So. Right there, this very image tells us a lot about this main character, this person who is um, pleasant, pretty, and also um, very much abiding to the ideals and the norms um, of true womanhood at the time. Now is the moment when we will move to the other and the third of the three images that structure the narrative, 
and here I want you to start looking at her hair. And may, many of you who are somewhat familiar with 19th century fiction and have read Jane Eyre will know what this hair style also now, no longer in a bun, but wild, open, loose stands for. You can probably guess. It reminds us of Bertha Mason, who was the mad woman in the attic in the uh, famous story by Air, and is really standing in for a trope in 19th century fiction that Gubar and uh, Gilbert referred to in the 1970s, feminist scholars. Um, is very common that if you, those women who were a little bit defiant and different, and Bertha Mason is also a person of color, and here they were wild, dangerous. So this is what we get towards the end of the narrative. And now um, is she being on top of him, yeah, and also emerging out of the pattern of the wallpaper after her struggle with this imaginary figure is a symbol, this symbolizes her emancipation and her freedom. So she is, um, yeah, out at last. So this is visualized here and now her hand is literally on top of his head. So this really enforces the reversal of the gender hierarchy. And the story started with male domination in a very nice and paternalistic, well-meaning manner. But here it is now her being literally on top of him. And Below, um, I added a, a quote from um, Golden, whose book I'm, I'm using, um, uh, who said, the narrator in some reader's eyes triumphs over patriarchy. So back to Nicole's statement about patriarchy, that is certainly a trope uh, in the critical discourse about the story. Uh, as you notice, the term never came up in the short story itself, obviously, but it is really what a lot of people see happening here, that the uh, it's not just John who is fainting, <laughs> but it is really more at stake here. Okay, and now um, I've got out at last. Those are her famous words. So... How was she able to get out and, in other words, emancipate herself, liberate? Um, it was through her identification with that figure in the wallpaper, right? It was through this identification and projection that she was able to escape this previous state of female confinement. And maybe on top of that right side, you'll see the quote, I had to creep over him every time. Now her voice suggests that she, you know, uh, needed to crawl over him. So um, it was a struggle, A. Eh? And she seems almost somewhat annoyed that she now has to do this, but she feels compelled to creep and crawl over him. And this metaphor of crawling is something that we will unpack uh, later on. Okay, so maybe now it's time after we set up using those two visuals, the overall narrative frame and the main themes of the short story, we can now 
elaborate on those themes that to some critics, it is about the violent process of feminization and liberation, as Elizabeth Ammons put it. Another dissertation by Ruala Cuavas uses this title, A New Woman's Journey into Insanity, to tell us something similar that it is now here, not a patient, but this very more self-confident person who's crawling on top of the man who's coming out, literally, out of the wallpaper to assert her identity. And that that is, as both these critics say, part of a larger process, the process to overcome the oppression. And I think that's really important. And we will have to unpack the stages of this process, how it was possible to do just that. Now, another theme is, and this is me saying it, you won't find it in the critical literature. That's why I haven't, well, yeah, yes, you do find it, but I find those arguments very convincing that visibility is really a fascinating theme because not only is the figure becoming visible yeah, to her, but it is also her own visibility. And you know, visibility or the um, metaphor of gaining a voice, the, the, the two metaphors are often used to illustrate this increasing sense of self-assertion by previously marginalized people. Gaslighting is a fairly contemporary term, as you all know. And uh, just to remind you, a good definition of gaslighting is that it's the, about the hidden, invisible, now again, the metaphor of visibility. So invisible forms of abuse. So usually in gender relations, when men manipulate women and say that they have a problem, they are crazy. And that very accusation of these women causes their gradual mental decline. So men can use this psychological mechanism to really drive women crazy because they're doubting their own self instinct. And it comes from a movie, as you probably know, uh, Gaslighting, where the protagonist dims the light, literally. And so she is, in a metaphorical sense, more and more, you know, uh, in the dark, doubting her own self and believing him when, in his rhetoric of putting her down. So, and I think something similar is happening here with John, although it's a loving version of gaslighting, but it's certainly about telling her that something is wrong with her. Although her own personal perspective, as you know, is that the unnamed protagonist just wants to go to another room, go visit friends, keep on writing, be active. That is her perspective of the matter. And he is um, yeah, demanding something else and suggesting that she is the problem. And it's only eventually that she starts to see now again, to realize the hidden dynamics and that she starts to trust her own instincts. And as the dead wallpaper comes alive. So there are the, the development towards her ability to distance herself from this gaslighting correlates with the, her seeing this figure in the paper. Yeah, so there's uh, an interesting, yeah, catalyst almost uh, of the, figure in the paper. And all of this is part of the process, a transformation 
that she undergoes towards liberal liberation literally uh, uh as she puts it you know i came what is what, what was the word um i have i i have got out at last so that and this transformation has i believe four stages i'm curious whether someone of you would opt for maybe three stages or five stages, but I would suggest, and I haven't read this anywhere, but this makes um, the most sense to me to really look at the four stages in relation to the other protagonists in the story. So her relation to John is really what is at stake at the very beginning. So John and I is what she says. And that is really happening for the first, you know, five pages or so, where she talks a lot about John. And then Jenny enters the picture. And also not just Jenny, the sister, but also the pattern of the paper itself. And the, I think it's the segment five or so. So in the middle of the story, and I will do a close reading of that, I find vital uh, passage. It is the pattern that is almost becoming a protagonist. And then the next stage is when, no, sorry, stay there. Uh, when she says, I have seen her. So it's no longer a pattern, it's a her now. So the personification of the paper is happening more and more. And that's on page 654. And then towards the very end, this is the part that starts with hooray, you know, I got out at last. Um, that I believe is then the fourth stage. So he and John, me and Jenny, me and the paper and me, and myself, I got out. I have to keep crawling. And along those four stages, um, and part of that is the changing role of Jenny. So I suggest that in the first part, she is, and she's referred to as the lovely, caring housekeeper the sister of John. And then the text tell, or the narrator tells us, Jenny sees to everything now. She's in control. So now Jenny is no longer just this nice caretaker. She has a certain amount of control over the narrator. And she becomes uh, an ally to John and his attempt to cure the narrator and then we have this part in the story where um it says jenny has an inexplicable look so she's starting to become ever more suspicious of jenny and her role and then towards the very end we have this fascinating sentence i don't know if you all noticed this i hadn't uh, for the first three times that I read the stories, but only now. It says, I've got out in spite of you and Jane. Now the narrator refers to Jenny by the name of Jane. And we as readers haven't been prepared for this name change. And so, but I think that Jane now is really Jenny. And now Jenny is really the antagonist towards the end, you know. Her liberation meant that she was able to free herself in spite of Jenny. So I think that is interesting. And maybe if we now take a closer look at this uh, quote towards the end, uh, go back real quick one more time. I got out at last in spite of you and Jane, and I've pulled off most of the paper. She was being active in this final breakthrough. I pulled off most of the paper. I did the work. So you, that is John and Jane, 
she's almost antagonistic or, or hostile towards them, you can put me back. She's very articulate about her annoyance now towards them putting them, put, putting her, <laughs> it's them pronoun didn't exist at the time, uh, putting her uh, into the box, into the trap, into the confinement. And the exclamation mark is an emphasis of this very self-assertive female voice. So what we get here in that final passage is autodiegetic voice, narratively speaking, but it's really a feminist voice, which is rare in 1890, or was rare in 1892. Okay, and now it's time to move on to look at that um, part, what I feel is a turning point, really, in the story. And that's an interesting twist when the paper becomes the protagonist is almost taking on a, a, a role of a, of a, of herself, I should say. And I was curious whether you all picked up on the metaphor. So here I highlight the uh, use of her and uh, surprisingly enough on that uh, short passage on page 654, it was mentioned three, six, seven times. So that is an indication for it meaning more than uh, just what we see at face value. And I wonder if um, anyone could tell me what the metaphor of the paper here, uh, and not just the, as a paper, but also as a personification of something, what that could stand for. Anyone dares to help me out on this? I've seen her, I can see her, um, I see her in the... What is she seeing? Well, I thought she just sees this other woman in the wallpaper as we have it in the in the picture and the other woman might as well be a, a reflection of herself an alternative of her own identity exactly I would agree with you Sammy on that and what is that identity that she is projecting onto that figure what kind of a identity is it mm -hmm. uh Jennifer, yeah, uh, maybe the the new woman. Though there's like a a sense of maybe a little bit of shame in the fact that she's creeping. Um, I also think it's really interesting that she just kind of says, "I always lock the door when I creep by daylight," mm. um, which I feel like is kind of odd and stands out to me right there because we know she's not leaving. Mm -hmm. So maybe there's a subconscious already she's transferring this identity to this new new woman which mm -hmm. is also like her new self in the future exactly. yeah yeah very good lovely and so let's take the first uh, appearance here and i'll tell you why privately i've seen her you know already i think there is almost this um tone of voice that expresses her anger. I can next I can see her out of every one of my windows. So she already is everywhere. So it is more a systemic situation than just an individual figure. And it certainly comes across that this is a very powerful woman. Um, I don't blame her a bit, you know, uh, so this is what she's projecting. And through this very projection, the, her, this figure, this pattern functions at a cat as a catalyst. She brings about something. She, you know, it's like an interesting psychological mechanism where you project onto someone or something else. 
something that you then yourself take on. And ultimately, the ideal that is projected here and that is that she writes into being is that of a feminist, if we want to use that term, that is now here an empowered woman who is not pleased or satisfied with her subordination. As the Victorian lady was supposed to be happy with her subordination because that was just the way it was in that ideology. But here we have someone who fights for the equality of uh, gender. And that's the definition of a feminist. Yeah, I think this is all I wanted to bring out on this end. And then we can move on to discuss the illustration in the middle. That's tricky and that's interesting. So what do we get? We get those two ladies and the caption here reads, she didn't know I was in the room. You might not be able to read this, but I spelled it out here. She didn't know I was in the room. So who is who and what's going on here? She, so it's the narrator's voice. That's the narrator with the same dress and rim here saying she, that is obviously Jenny, the only other female protagonist in the story, didn't know I was in the room. And that's why Jenny looks a little bit awkward and weird here, somewhat frightened, somewhat like dozing off. And um, you also see not only in the background here, if you look closely, but then certainly here in the pattern on the side, the, um, and you see on the right, I uh, did a screenshot of the detail where she points to with her hand, that is uh, the pattern on the wall. Um, these illustrations, just to give you an understanding, were, done, were part of the original um, that appeared in the New England magazine. And it, it was done by Joe Hatfield, who, an illustrator who wasn't that well known. And The difficulty to unpack this image, I think, stands for the difficulty to decode some of the subtle clues and illusions in the text itself. So the sense of ambiguity that is there is already touched on in this particular um, image. And now I'm coming back to the story level, level. And if you could go to the next slide, because here I wanted you to look at a few features of the passage where Jenny appears. So um, And now we might want to point to a few narrative devices that are remarkable here. Um, and, the, and that cultivates deceit for I don't tell them I'm awake. I don't tell them I'm awake, oh no. So this is, oh no is as I suggest here, a form of interior monologue. Kerstin, uh, Sandrock, maybe you want to uh, correct me if I'm wrong on any of the narratological devices, but the exclamation mark is also another interesting feature here because it's, as uh, you know, not the conventional way, but she is using this also graphic device, rhetoric device to add emphasis uh, to her voice. Now, what else is there? Um, 
the illusion, the fact is I'm getting a little bit afraid of John. As of now, in the overall development of the story, she doesn't necessarily have to feel uh, threatened by him. But I think this is an illusion or almost a foreshadowing of something that is to come. And then the next passage, I've watched John when he did not know I was looking, is one of the many examples where focalization plays a role in this autodiagetic narrative. I watched John, she watched the pattern in the paper on the paper. So focalization is really what also helps us as readers to really identify with the um, narrator. So graphic components also interesting that she would highlight visually now the phrase looking at the paper. So the emphasis, not only through the exclamation mark, but also through the italics, that this is um, now becoming more and more pertinent, what the paper is all about. And what about the metaphor? And I haven't really found a good uh, reading of that or an answer to what, not just the paper, that's easy, but then this fact that the touching the paper stains everything with yellow smooches all over the clothes. So it's not just an eerie paper where a lot of things are happening, <laughs> but there is also this aspect of it that it affects people who touch it. So I find that this is really giving power to the, the paper that it is literally able to do something uh, to people. So lastly, the very end of this passage on uh, page, where was it, 653, is I am determined that nobody shall find it out but myself. Right here, that is one of the earlier passages where she is really assertive, and if you wish, feminist. Okay, then we shall move on. Um, this is now from uh, Treckler's article uh, entitled Escaping the Sentence. And I thought it's a nice uh, observation. This engagement with the yellow wallpaper constitutes a form of the work which has been forbidden women's writing. So paper as in wallpaper and paper to write on. Um, as she steps over the patriarchal body, she leaves the authoritative voice of diagnosis in shambles at her feet. Great phrasing forsaking women's language forever her new mode of speaking and unlawful language escapes the sentence imposed by patriarchy so i thought that was really clever so it's not just the triumph over to patriarchy no it's also the feminine language and escaping the sentence as in the grammatically correct uh way of speaking and that the kind of women's language is also coming to the fore, according to Treichler's argument. Yes. So now we can maybe go back to the moment where we have this confrontation between the new and the old woman, if you wish. So the new woman being the narrator who in the halfway through the story becomes more and more the embodiment of the new woman um, not dressed like it so no bloomers that was the uh, as you might know the indication for the fashion of the new woman but jenny certainly stands 
for the more traditional kind of womanhood. And this has a lot to do with the paper itself. And the new woman is able to read the paper and by reading the paper, seeing the figure in the pattern, she is able to take on that feminist identity and overcome female oppression. And this is also why she later on in the story sees women in the garden. So it's, it's also fascinating how the shift from it's just a pattern, then it's her, the personification of a figure. And then later on, she talks about that figure also being in the plural women. She's not just seeing in the wall paper, but also out in the garden. So there's something larger, even a, a larger dimension here. Yeah. And then we can move on to uh, another quote. Um, let's see, back to Trickler. Maybe you will all want to read it. Wait, uh, I was there already. Um, sorry, sorry. No, now we do the analysis, analysis of the narrative situation okay yes um you are all readers of fiction so this is uh, really literary analysis 101 but i think it's really fascinating to look at not just the content which is something that we've covered extensively now uh, but also the form and here i want to invite you to tell me what how you would call this um I know there are students in the room, maybe you dare to um, raise your voice and help me out here. I got positively angry with the impertinence of it. So this is already the self-assertive, strong, feminist voice. But the point is, from a narratological point of view, it's the autodiegetic voice. And had this story, wait, had the story not been written in the autodiegetic mode, homodiegetic with a character acting in it, then it would have fallen flat. None of you would have enjoyed reading it if it were in the third person in the heterodiegetic mode. So it really relies on that first person perspective. Otherwise we wouldn't have been able to identify with the narrator. I think so. This is really key. So now next, it don't I look, it don't know why I should write this. I don't know why I should write this. Um, I think that's a typo. Sorry. I don't know why I should write this. Is what it says on page six hundred fifty one, and I think it's one of the few occurrences of this particular way of. Um, referring to the process of writing itself. Any suggestions here? A, what it's called, and, and B, you know, maybe why it matters. Have I lost you already? I know this is about the time when it's getting tired, <laughs> tiring to listen to one person having to speak all the time. Yeah, Jennifer. Is this meta meta narrative? Cool. Yeah, exactly. A meta fiction, meta narrative, same thing. Um, and I don't have an answer yet to what the function of it is. Why? I mean, sure, it's a yeah, it's a not only a piece about her, but it's about writing. So that's also an interesting formal correlative. Can you read this out for me, Jennifer? Your English is yeah. impeccable. <laughs> Thank you. I never saw a worse paper in my life. One of those um, sprawling. Thank you. Sprawling, flamboyant patterns meeting every artistic sin. And when you follow the lame, uncertain curves for a little distance, they suddenly commit suicide. I caught him several times looking at the paper. So I saw when you follow the line, I caught him 
looking is I don't want to be nitty picky here, but um, go. Oh, it's done. External focalization. And I think that's also fascinating how the focalization shifts onto John, onto the paper, onto the different patterns. Okay, now. The paper itself. We haven't really unpacked the symbolism of the paper, and those lines here should uh, help you to to do that. What it stands for. So it's not feminism. It's not patriarchy. What is it really? And it is dull yet lurid orange in some places. Is sickly sulfur tint in others. The disturbing color and odor is now my wording is what the narrator picks up on. So it's really smelly, creepy, yucky. And not only that it's unpleasant to look at, this paper looks to me as if it were as if it knew what a vicious influence it had. You know, it's almost animated it is doing something to the narrator then it, the paper it says here apparently turns her into a victim the vicious influence um makes her uh, a victim so uh, of of yeah her domestic confinement you could say mm -hmm. And there's again and again the personification of the paper and sometimes it has the negative influence but that changes and later as i argued it has a yeah, performative influence it brings about something it is the, it becomes this catalyst now the creeping woman that's interesting oh what does that stand for there are so many of those creeping women and they creep so fast so creeping is i think you would agree you know uh, symbolizing the subjugation they're crawling and creeping on all fours whereas the dominant male figure is standing erect <laughs> and um but they creep so fast could also mean that the women are struggling to get out of it so it is again i find the dialectic of crawling being like subordinated but then fighting moving on to overcome that sense of subordination towards liberation okay uh-huh and now this is a longer part we need this um it starts with a part from the uh short story itself and then Triclern makes a pretty interesting argument let me see um unveiled the yellow wallpaper as a metaphor for women's discourse from a conventional perspective it first seems strange boy, and confusing outrageous so negative the very act of a woman's writing produces discourse which embodies unheard of contradictions so bringing out this other contradictory mindset once freed once the liberation emancipation has happened it expresses what is elsewhere kept hidden and embodies patterns that the patriarchal order ignores suppresses fears as grotesque or fails to perceive at all that's yeah sure towards the end you know uh, that voice becomes louder like all good metaphors the yellow wallpaper is variously interpreted by readers to represent the pattern which underlies sexual inequality so the pattern is really what we say with uh, and we use the term the system um and the pattern is that of gender inequality and other forms of inequality 
and now. So we need a breather. Uh, let's do that slide and then maybe have a few minutes of a break. But this is not your propagandistic feminist story of an increasingly strengthening form of female self-awareness and identity. No, this text is full of ambiguity. So, and this is also, I believe, reflected in the responses of two contemporary early male readers. And I find this really fascinating that Howes, Dean, John Dean Howes, whom you have probably come across in this lecture, um, who was the editor of the Atlantic Monthly, he liked the story and he recommended it to the then following editor, Horace Scudder, who rejected the story, who did not like it. And he even told Gilman later on saying, I could not forgive myself if I made others as miserable as I have made myself after reading. So he felt miserable. Why would he as a male reader at the time feel miserable? Well, he told us the story was an attack on husband, child and home. So he picked up on the anti-patriarchal subtext reacting to it with aversion. So, but it, the text, you know, yeah, didn't say it explicitly, but I think he responded to that. And then there's another male reviewer from 1899, and he said, nothing more graphic and suggestive has ever been written to show why so many women go crazy, especially farmers' wives who live lonely, monotonous, lives. So he is in a roundabout way um, supporting that feminist claim that this is not a very humane way of existence into which women were forced into uh, at the time collectively, not just the narrator. And um, Let's forget about the quote, but the last line, the richest, richly ambiguous story. I liked that the mm, article picked up on uh, that it defies one reductive explanation. Here are the two different mutually exclusive readings. And that brings us back to the very beginning when Jennifer and Nicole suggested uh, their reading. And it does exist at the same time. And that's maybe also what enriches this text. I like I liked your comment on the animism, you know, the animist uh, element in that wallpaper. I think that is very interesting, you know, because if the wallpaper stands for something conceptual, it basically basically means that the conceptual thing, you know, has has agency and becomes alive and does something. So uh, as a person who's worked on, on black American culture, I think that is fascinating um, to see the same kind of semiotic element also in this. Uh, in this white woman who is, uh, you know, using animation in some ways. I think that's extremely fascinating. But I didn't talk about animation or animated. Well, you said the paper is animated somehow, you know, I, I, I can connect that to animism, you know, the idea that, that you know, concepts, okay. concepts are alive and, and they, 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 um, they have agency. Mm -hmm. And uh, in some ways, of course, the wallpaper is a, uh, an image, it's, it's, uh, it stands for certain values for concepts, even though sometimes ambiguous and complicated, obviously. Mm -hmm. As a Howells person, um, I'm 
I feel um, confirmed, you know, that, that Howells was an interesting person who was interested in all kinds of uh, um, new perspectives and perspectives that were different from his own. Um, and so he supported all kinds of people who probably would not have supported him, um, um, which I think is, is interesting. Um, when Blackwell talks about the farmer's wives, I'm, I'm not very convinced about that because farmer's wives may have monotonous lives, but they're constantly doing stuff. You know, this is more of the bourgeois wives who are supposed mm -hmm. to, you know, be domestic and locked up in their, um, in their rooms. Um, you know, um, the farmer's wives are much healthier in my opinion. They're outside, they're working. Mm -hmm. So I think that's a, uh, a red herring that's a wrong lead <laughs> <laughs> okay so now we may continue um sammy just uh, shared a few of his opinions is there anyone else who wants to say a little bit about the first half of my or the first part of my presentation it won't be another full hour i uh, promise um just focused on the text itself. And now I want to explore the context um, and the context of the rest cure, for example, and the medical context and the biographical context and the context of the women's movement. That's what's ahead of us. Okay, so let's start. So this is very much a story about a specific treatment of an illness that existed at the time that Gilman herself suffered from uh, postnatal depression. And we have um, her own suspicion towards the cure. And on the right, you see the doctor who became famous for treating this and the symptoms now thanks uh, are the following and it was referred to as the, uh, at the time as neurasthesia or sometimes neurosis and in the story the diagnosis that we are giving is it's a temporary nervous depression coupled with a slight hysterical tendency so the word hysteria um is important obviously because the um, hysteria was very common or uh, as a label and as a diagnosis around the turn of the century and some gentlemen like on the right you see an illustration of a doctor at uh, Salpetriere in Paris where they around the same time when the story was published they started the treatment of patients mostly female patients as you know hysteria comes from uterus womb in greek and it was assumed that it was hereditary and had something to do with the women's body that they acted out in these weird manners and um Charcot was the one who started it and his main treatment was hypnosis and later on Freud, but that was only um, in a, uh, at the beginning of the turn of the century when Freud then did his famous studies of hysteria. So, and here the treatment of Weir, which was called the rescuer, uh, forbid her to work and to write and uh, any intellectual stimulation was considered dangerous. And as you know, this was exactly what the nameless protagonist uh, objected to because she felt it would do her good. The isolation was part of the cure and uh, no one around, just Jenny now and then. So from our perspective, you know, that exacerbated the problem, but to Dr. Uh, Ware Mitchell, that was um, supposedly helpful. And now, her response was at the beginning, very tentative. You know, I don't think this is really helping me, but more and more then she moved away from the male authoritative um, enforcement of that cure and um, developed her 
own reasoning and started to trust her own feelings. And this is what I want to call medical gaslighting. I don't think the term has ever been used in the context of reading the story, but um, it is very much something that is also currently happening that a lot of female patients go to, let's say, gynecologists and talk about symptoms and that those symptoms are not taken seriously. And then the women are uh, sent back home again and uh, with the recommendation that yeah, they shouldn't take it so seriously, pop a pill and it'll go away. But then often there are a few um, serious um, symptoms that are then not being treated. And I think something like medical gaslighting is happening in this story. And the story also talks about overcoming and, and, and contrasting and countering this sexist, many, in many ways, treatment. I mean, it didn't do those female patients much good. Okay, now, and this is getting us to the biographical level because Charlotte Perkins Gilman, who was doing this in her life and lived uh, from 1816 to 35, and who was coming out of a famous family. She was marrying this painter guy, Stent Stenson, his last name, in 1884, then became a mother herself of Catherine. And then she immediately had this postnatal depression and fell into a crisis herself. And that was really severe. And she really talked about how she crawled uh, around and was uh, suffering so drastically that she then required the help of the only person who was able or who was known for treating um, hysteria and postnatal depression that it was Dr. Ware Mitchell. And that didn't help. And then G Gilman herself decided that she was going to abandon her husband and move out west and live with a close friend and her husband, the Channings. So her way then was after the treatment failed that she freed herself by uh, divorcing and also officially divorcing her husband. And what happened then was that she lived out in California for a while and then with her daughter and then her husband came to visit also the daughter and her husband fell in love with a friend of hers, Chenning. They got married and then Charlotte Perkins Gilman left the child, her own daughter in the custody of her father and this new wife. And then she moved on and moved to, uh, to several other cities, Oakland, San Francisco, whatnot. And it was then only in 1900 that she found another love, uh, apparently that was her cousin and they were in a 34 years of marriage. About her sexual life and identity and whether she was heterosexual, there are quite a few of rumors because Charlotte Perkins Gilman had very long affairs and friendships with um, at least two women. And uh, the Wikipedia entry on Adelaine Knapp tells us that they had a passionate lesbian affair. I don't know if that's the case, but apparently um, Gilman was also very unconventional in that matter. And now so much for her biographical, for the biographical context. Now let's move on to that part of her biography that refers to her life after 1900, roughly, when she was to become more and more established and famous as an activist, not only for the women's movement, but also as a socialist and also as a 
an environmentalist to a certain degree. So here you see her at a women's suffrage convention. So it was really a part of this movement of the suffrage movement and gave lectures all over and traveled around and um, uh, to the right, you see uh, the Atlanta Constitution, the paper in 1916 that had her statements about feminism. She gave speeches at the National American Women's Suffrage Association in 1903, and she uh, wrote even a tribute to one of the major figures in the American women's uh, suffrage movement, and she later founded her own party, the Women's Peace Party. So politically active, and then she published a zillion pub books, um, essays, and I just want to mention those two in addition to the short story that you've read. Women and Economics, uh, really one of the major feminist statements because she urged for financial independence of women which wasn't the case, as you can imagine. And um, Ger Herland is a utopia. It talks about a society of women where women have the ability to reproduce and they also have more power than men. And so this is an, um, yeah, a feminist world that is described as a paradise almost. Now, she was a feminist, although she never liked the label. She objected to the term feminist because it was negatively charged. So this was way before uh, Beyoncé <laughs> um, stepped on the stage and, and made uh, feminism look good. And also Emma Watson's famous speech here, uh, you see her on the right. Um, mm, um, we are all feminists and um, Adichie also giving her famous statement on feminism. So we really have to situate her in this wider context of what happened between the 1840s in America. And that was the time when the first two feminists, and you, you see them in their funky Victorian dresses, Susan B. Anthony and Katie Stanton, that was like the power pack, the two women that got together and they started it all. They wrote the famous declaration of sentiments that you see here. And that some of you might have come across this famous statement crafted by Stanton, who by, by the way, was a mother of seven um, and Anthony didn't have any children and they lived together, they wrote together, they were really a, yeah, a good team. And so you might have read it, I don't know, what they did is they took the Declaration of um, Independence, the official document, and you see it down here with the passages that I highlight in yellow, they asserted into the original text the words and women, that all men and women are created equal. Uh, to these ends, it is the right of those who suffer from it to refuse allegiance to it and to insist upon the institution of a new government. And the new government that they wanted to see was one that treated men and women equally. All of this is was happening, and I just leave it out there for you. I can't like go into details about um, the Married Women's Property Act that was still in place in the eighteen nineteenth century, even um, then the. Uh, NWSA is the National Women's uh, Suffrage Association that was founded in 1870. And the declarations of sentiments on the right top I just talked about that was um, the shot that went around. And ultimately, all those attempts, as you know, culminated in 1920, when 
the women's right to vote was ratified. So the 19th Amendment was ratified. And finally, in the US, in 1920, women were allowed to vote. And Perkins Gilman was really part of those efforts. And this is not the time to talk about the women's movement. So I only want to throw this, uh, go back, um, mention that this interesting film, uh, The Suffragettes or The Suffragette, um, is fascinating because it deals with the same time when Perkins Gilman published that story and then later on up to 1920 when the right to vote was won. But it covers the extent of the sacrifice that the women who were part of it down below, you see some of them with their signs up and standing out in the cold, protesting or going to prison for what they did. And they were in prison and the force feeding happened um, and they would not buckle down. And one of, yeah, now you go to the motherhood slide. I think the movie does a good job in showing the sacrifices that some of these suffragettes made for example, this character in the film refers to someone who was a, is a loving mother, but then she decided to become involved in the movement. And then the male authority figures, uh, the policemen, took her in and um, her husband then would uh, want to protect, quote unquote, their child. and. Uh, separated from his wife or wouldn't allow her to um, stay with a child. So at the right, you'll see the melodramatic moment when she had to sacrifice her own son because she wanted to be part of the movement. So I think this is maybe, um, you can skip that. Skip that. Um, this is the triumph, not just of the feminists who then were able to uh, have the privilege to cast a vote. It was the story, now I'm getting back to Gilman, is also tri a triumph because in the context of the rest cure and the attempts to treat the female disease of uh, hysteria and um, depressions, uh, such as the one that the protagonist and the narrator suffers from, that was what she went through. And that is, well, that was also her intention, she says, we don't need to read it out in the passages below to see to it that the treatment of Sir Mitchell would end because she felt that that was so devastating to her and also to other women that um, she hoped that her story would help to upend that medical practice. And it did. So it's really also, a testament to the power of fiction. The last two lines, let's go back. I read it. Mitchell changed his methods upon reading her story. So he did really change his methods after he read the story. She proudly remarked, if that is a fact, I have not lived in vain. Okay, now the last aspect, and then I will close, is the text that was also assigned today, uh, another text, an essay, where Gilman writes about what she calls our androcentric culture of this man-made world. And it's really amazing to the, the extent to which she saw what very few people at the time noticed and what we today um 
I mean, this is not commonsensical, but a lot of feminists would subscribe to that, that she is accusing the system, this man-made world, where the dominant male, I'm reading um, the, from the first, from the second chapter, is holding his women as property. Very strong way of referring to the oppression. And then she says in this patriarchate, she almost uses the term that is so commonplace today, patriarchy, the woman is the property of the man and considered first and foremost a means of pleasure to him. Now this gets us back to the illustration of the pleasant, pretty woman in the rocking chair. And the duty of the wife is to basically serve him, she says. The man holds the woman primarily for his satisfaction and service then necessarily he shuts her up. Being so kept shut up, literally entrapped, she cannot develop humanly as she has throughout social contact. And this understanding of humanly and the last line on this slide and the last word refers to humanness. That was her agenda. So she was trying to argue in those publications that it's not only about the equality of gender and the sexes and about the ability to vote and maybe even overcome some of the sexist uh, legal uh, measures, but it is also about humaneness, what's at stake here. And that involves both men and women, because that system she noticed is not just hurting women, but also men. And maybe I have more, but maybe, yeah, this is also from the reading that you read. And I find it really fascinating how she then elaborates on this notion of humanness. And this was also why she didn't like to call herself a feminist. She wanted to call herself a humanist. Okay, you want to continue on uh, the outlook? And this is really how I end. Um, why is this relevant? Well, certainly 130 years ago, she was the most influential thinker in the US. And she was also, I believe, prescient and a trailblazer, particularly in the lesser acknowledged works. So like the one I just mentioned. A longer quote on her relevance in the 20th century, I think that is really a good point that the um, she's educating future generations to create a humane and nurturing environment. So if that is the case, she would have done the job. And the relevance for the 21st century, that's the open question with which I want to end. Thank you for being attentive and for listening. So. Perfect, thank you so much. That was a wonderful talk. Um, I just see these pictures. Is there, is there, is there a movie of the, of the, the short story that I've never seen? And um, they're mostly theater performances. Okay. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's the, fascinating. Elena Schaubühne did one a couple of years ago and many other okay okay oh i didn't know that oh that's exciting mm -hmm. wonderful okay that was very rich you took us into the middle of these these issues and uh made a couple of interesting statements so let me open the floor and find out if there's anybody in our audience who has a, a reaction or a question or a challenge whatever so when i was reading the text um and she said that thing about Jane. And I wondered, it, it would is it possible? Do you think there could be another interpretation that Jane could be not Jenny, but actually like a disassociation from maybe like Jane is herself mm. and Jane could be this maybe person she doesn't want to be anymore if that and and if that would work with the new woman idea that she's now being like 
you know, despite you and Jane, I'm going to move forward. I'm going to get out. I'm not going to be associated with that identity anymore. Do you think there's a, a room for that kind of interpretation? I will open the floor and, and see whether people nod or go no, but it's an interesting interpretation, definitely. We never learn her name throughout the story, right? Do you think that's the moment where she finally tells us her name, maybe? Despite Jane? Mm -hmm. despite yeah, I came wife, across maybe? one critic who, who said something like that, that we Ooh. assumed that her name was Jane. But it, again, it's ambiguous, and that's the beauty. That's what makes it rich. You know, it could be Jenny, in spite of Jenny, definitely, but in spite of her old self, the Jane mm -hmm. and the rocking chair. And her new womanist self is now Jennifer. That was a joke. <laughs> okay, that's interesting. Any other? Questions, observations? Alan Scheibler has a question. Yes. Thank you very much for the talk. Really, really enlightening. Um, I I think it's the third time that I read it, but I think every time that I read it, I find something new. And it just struck me um, today. It's so relevant, especially in combination with this um, uh, um, the 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 latter one the latter text that we read on on this patriarchy how um still relevant it is today and now um if we're looking around the world and things are happening again and we're moving backwards i mean we're taking or they're taking away women's rights um left and right i mean we're looking to the states and we see it also in iran and and in other countries and it's just I mean, it's 150 years old and it's still so, so present and it's coming back. And, and, and I think, um, how much, um, how many steps have we really taken? So I, um, I, I found it really, uh, an interesting text also from that perspective. Mm. Certainly. Yeah. Maybe someone else wants to step in because I can but agree that the sense of confinement is still very real for women in Afghanistan right now as we speak. They are stuck at home, not allowed to go to the park, not allowed to go to the gym, having to wear the burqa. And I just heard a 19 year old woman yesterday talk about her experience in that situation. And uh, since I was preparing the talk, uh, it, it really reminded me of the situation of 19th century women in Western countries like the US. Mm -hmm. And it's sad that uh, it is happening in other parts of the world right now. But I think, you know, there's a silver lining. There is a positive aspect to it. We are here in this classroom. Right here, we are educated women. And um, Ampel Coalition almost had a 50% <laughs> participation of uh, women in the government. And, uh, you know, it's changing. And it can it's unstoppable. Putin will die. It is changing, but it's also scary if you look to the states how um, how it's also changing back. And um, if you look at politics, how how far to the right we go, and, and it's just scary. Could it happen here? I don't think it's gonna happen here, but it's just really scary that certain things that we took for granted 20, 30 years ago suddenly is not that given anymore. So. I mean, yeah. not here, but in the States. So, um, yes, I think it's important that we also are aware of it, that it's a privilege and that we keep fighting for it, that it's not, uh, we're not there yet, you know, we're not uh, in an equal society yet. So, but. I agree. Yeah, the, the question is culture, you know, when you say we, you know, that is, is, is very complicated, you know, because we have a large world and we have many different cultures and many different worlds and then the, the you know the question of how does one world influence the other world is a extremely complicated one and uh, you know so it, it's very difficult to you know to have one kind of uh, 
female experience because that's different in the whole world that's very very complicated i guess even though it's clear in which direction we want to go i don't think that's the goal i like the notion of humanness i thought that was very interesting you know and that you emphasize that at a time you know um when uh you know we're, we're slowly going away you know from these uh post-structuralist attitudes of uh trashing the enlightenment and trashing uh, uh humanism and basically saying you know this is just uh another way of uh um um controlling other kinds of people. I think there's a, an amazing shift in values happening nowadays, and we're rediscovering certain liberties that we do have in the West that we have forgotten being uh, really aware of as, as, as privileges. I think this is probably also what Ann was probably hinting at, you know, and there's a lot of places where um, people can no longer do that. Mm -hmm. Women okay. especially. Maybe yeah. we have one last comment before we close. We have more. Nicole has one. Um, I also would like to pick up on the aspect of humanness you mentioned in the last slide. Um, I would say that writing and creativity are very important here because it brings about this catharsis, emotional purification. Mm. And we obviously see what happens when um, the protagonist is devoid of any creativity, um, that she feels worse. Um, and she's decaying, her soul is also in decay. So I think um, the story encourages us also to become creative and making our voices heard, that creativity makes us alive and conscious, and then we can counter the system that's so oppressive. Awesome. I couldn't, couldn't have said it any better. Correct. I think Mai may have a last comment or, or question. Mai, are you here? Yes, um, thank you very much for your talk. Um, you mentioned... Brummel, could you explain that a little bit further? I know it's fashion um, and not literature, but yeah, still. Uh, bloomers, you mean? Or what? Uh, I didn't hear that word. Can you like say that? What uh, is Brummel? I don't Brummel? know how to pronounce it. Um, you mentioned it the with fashion of new woman. Okay, also. yeah. Bloomers, uh, that's the word for a certain type of uh, pants. So, as you know, in the 19th century, women were wearing dresses all the time. And um, that changed right around the turn of the century with the new woman uh, often wearing these, yeah, pants with what blooming, fluffy pants. They're comfortable. Uh, they're not. Uh, tight pants, but that was the first attempt to really also allow for a dress code that gave women more freedom and mobility. Mm -hmm. So they could ride a bicycle, imagine that. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Okay. Exactly. And the bloomers didn't show the shape of the body, you know, so they were not too provocative, I assume. That was a, another issue, you know. <laughs> okay. Um, um, thank you very much. I think that was a wonderful talk. But um, thank you very much for this very provocative um, talk. And you did a lot of close reading, which I thought was also extremely inspiring. So that was absolutely fantastic. Perfect. Thanks, Sahib. Um, we could even record this and uh, it will be, um, you know, on the Carl Schurz House website uh, within a week or so, I hope. Um, we have two more meetings Thursday evenings and uh, I hope we will have as nice a crowd as we had today. That was really exciting. Okay. And thank you very much, Siglinde, for a wonderful talk. I, I really enjoyed it. That was terrific. Take care, everybody. Bye-bye. See you next week.